My name is Erin Meyer. I am the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at UC Merced. Um, I am here to introduce Peter Nelson, Alicia Neslidge, and uh, Guillermo Ortiz as well. We started a panel series to just really talk to cool people who created cool films or shorts and documentaries and stuff like that. So that's a little bit about me and the program. I will kick it off to Guillermo. Guillermo, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Guillermo Ortiz. I am the Sustainability and Diversity Educational Programs Manager here at UC Merced in the Office of Sustainability. Uh, and like Aaron said, we started this series so we can uh, really get some more insights on passion projects and things that folks have been working on and, and telling really interesting stories and then kind of like peeling back the layers and seeing how that project actually came about. So thank you all for coming and I, I'm looking really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Alicia, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, my name is Alicia Nesledge. I am a double major at UC Merced. I'm currently majoring in political science and philosophy, and I work with Erin. <laughs> Thank you, and it's lovely to work with you. All right. Peter, welcome. Would you like to give a brief intro and then we can just launch into questions after that? Sure, yeah, um, I'm Peter Nelson and uh, I directed and photographed and co-produced uh, the Pollinators uh, documentary. Um, and uh, my day job, this is my first film that I've uh, directed, my first feature film that I've directed. Um, and this uh, came from a place of uh, combined interest for me. I'm a, a longtime beekeeper, 30 year beekeeper, over 30 years. Um, but my day job is that I'm a cinematographer and I do uh, documentaries and commercials and occasionally uh, feature films and uh, or narrative films. And I have a, a great interest in food and agriculture. And so I wanted to do a film about um, this, these commercial migratory beekeepers because I felt like it was a story that many people didn't know and most people didn't realize how uh, essential the work that they do is to our food system. And so I wanted to try and connect those dots. Uh, and, uh, and it started really as a, as a backyard film, literally uh, filmed in our backyard because I do have a, a few hives of bees. And, um, and we had a, a great time doing it. And so this has uh, just been a blast to, to get it out there and, and meet people. So thank you all. Thanks, I should have started off by saying thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and keep my puns, my bee puns limited, but um, let them fly. Ah. <laughs> oh, be me too. That's a sweet one. I like it. <laughs> I will also refrain from calling anyone honey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> except maybe my dog. Yeah. Um, anyway, Alicia, you want to just start off and ask some questions? Um, yes. If anyone has questions also in the audience that they want to ask, feel free and just throw it in chat. Um, and we'll be monitoring monitoring that. And uh, otherwise, Alicia, feel free. Go ahead. So Peter, I'm a little surprised you didn't mention that you won 11 festival awards so far. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been great. I mean, we, we've had a, um, a really good time with it. So we, we've done about 30 over 30 film festivals at this point, and we're kind of winding um, down on it. There's a couple more that we're, we're probably going to do this year. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we, we've had a great time and people have, it's, it's, it's been an interesting thing because people have bees, anybody who, who works with bees or is a beekeeper knows that bees are a great conversation starter. People love to ask questions of bees. Um, they, they always have questions for me about bees whenever I talk to somebody. And, uh, generally I think when, when we did this, people, there's a great knowledge, I think, a feeling that uh, people um, know that there's something wrong with the bees, something wrong with the bees, but they don't know what it is. And so, and it's not one thing, and that makes it a little even more complex. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really fun. Uh, we had a, a great time traveling around with the film um, when we could travel around and go to in-person film festivals. And um, the, um, you know, it, it's just the, the the, the awards have been great, but the more meaningful thing for me is when people say, I, I look at my food in a different way, or I went home and I, I look at my dandelions in my lawn with a new appreciation or things like that. Those are, those are the, 
the great rewards for, for us with this. Neat. And thank you for those takeaways. Um, so our first questions are on insecticides. And it says, what are your thoughts on neonicotinoids? Yeah, neonicotinoids are, are um, a, a big problem for many uh, beekeepers. Um, and they're a um, pesticide that is, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, they're a, a systemic pesticide, meaning that they are typically coated on the seed of a plant. Sometimes the soil is drenched depending on the type of plant and it goes up through the vascular system of the plant. And so it gets into the, um, the leaves, but also the flowers and the pollen and the nectar. And the, they're good in the sense that they're very safe for people to handle, much, more, much safer than the traditional uh, carbamate pesticides. Um, but they're, they're, the problem is there's a lot of collateral damage with them. And it's, uh, so, so what happens is when the, the pest that would try and get the, the, the targeted pest, it would bite into the plant, they would die. But it, since it, they do go into um, the pollen and, and the nectar, it gets shared with collateral damage with bees and not just honeybees, but with, uh, with all the native bees as well. And so um, I recognize that uh, farmers need to do uh, use pesticides. Um, and, but I think that the, the way that they're used, uh, one of the farmers in the film said to me like using a, a neonicotinoid putting it on uh, a plant when you put the seed in the ground is kind of like taking an aspirin because you might have a headache sometime down the road you know instead of using an integrated pest management system which means okay we have uh, pests on these plants and uh, it gets to a certain point when we have to do something about it then we treat or you target treat specific plants rather than saturating everything and just uh, um, collateral damage. So it's, it's a complex issue. Um, they're really widespread. Um, they are very long lasting in the environment. They're water soluble. Um, so they get into streams, they get into water supplies. Um, and so as a, I'm also a fly fisherman. So as a fly fisherman, you know, I look at trout and other fish feed on insects. And so if you get into the, into the water system, you're gonna probably kill some of those insects. And so that's something that concerns me. And I wonder, I, I don't know what the long-term effect is on other creatures as well. I know there's been some studies done with deer about uh, neonicotinoid um, uh, 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 exposure, but um, it's a complex issue and they're really hard for bees, uh, for beekeepers, because they, people get dosed or bees get dosed and, um, and it's, a, it's a big problem. Thank you. Could it be claimed that buying organic produce directly helps the bees since they use, since they don't use insecticides? It's certainly or if a they step- do very little? Yeah, it's a step in the right direction for sure. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, I don't, you know, I personally don't buy everything organic, but I do, uh, we do buy uh, some organic or try to buy organic. Um, but more importantly, I think it's uh, a, a good thing to do is to ask those questions about whether, because you can be, grow uh, not in an organic way and still be safe for bees. And so I don't, you know, it's, it's a, depending on how things are grown, they can be grown in a way plants can be grown in a way that, um, that is safe for bees and not be organic, although organic is a, is a great way to go. But it's great to have that dialogue with uh, farmers. If you go to a farmer's market, ask them, what do they spray, if they spray, and how often they spray, you know? Um, so that's really important, um, that conversation to have with the people that grow our food. That's a great recommendation, thank you. Yeah, just, um, just a, one more little follow up on that is that um, just about that issue about farmers markets or CSAs or whatever is most of the farmers that I've met um, have a tremendous pride in what they do. And uh, they're happy to talk about how they grow things. And they're really, uh, they really like to have that um, conversation. Um, and uh, there's a, a relationship there between the farmer, the grower, and the the person buying that stuff. And so I think that that's something that, you know, it's a part of the solution is having more of that conversation and learning more about where our food comes from and who grows it. Absolutely. I know what conversations I'll be having. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could a person start their own beehive at their house and maintain the bees healthily? And what would be their biggest challenge? 
Yeah, it's um, you certainly can, and um, you know that's uh, how I started. Um, uh, I oh, I don't want to discourage anybody from keeping bees, but I would. What I always recommend people do is uh, read as much as you can before you do it. Um, get a mentor. Um, find a bee club near where you live, and they're all over the all over the country. Um, and uh, also plant a garden because you have to have uh, forage for those uh, for those bees. And again, it's not just honeybees, but it's uh, all the native bees. And so that's a helpful thing that anybody can do. Um, but it's important to, um, to establish uh, a food source uh, for the bees. And the cleaner you keep your food source for the bees, the better it will be for the bees. Um, but it's a, it's a, and this is a great time of year if somebody wants to do that, because a lot of bee clubs I know are doing classes. And I would recommend that uh, to take that route to learn from a group of people because it's a lot of work and a lot of people don't realize how much is involved with uh, beekeeping. It's tremendously rewarding. And I am fascinated by honeybees. I get lost in it when I go out into my own bees um, about, you know, uh, I just always am seeing something and learning something every time I go out there. Plus it's genuinely relaxing, but there's a lot to it and um, it's changing. There's a lot of uh, science and there's a, you know, nutrition issues and with the bees and, and uh, of course, pesticides and fungicides. And so it's a, it's a great thing, but it's uh, much more than just, um, you know, putting a box in the backyard. Thank you. I see there's a question from Ashley. Ashley, do you want me to ask or would you like to? Hey, I'm happy to ask. So, um, hey everyone, and Peter, thanks for taking your time to share. I have a friend who is a, uh, they're farmers in the Midwest. And there's a beautiful river that runs alongside of their property. And I keep thinking, you need to be a bee hotel when they're traveling across country and they need places for the bees to kind of rejuvenate and hang over for a few days before you know the next crop is ready to start the pollination period. But you know they're in um, a part where there is a lot of regulation from the government as far as what can be put on those larger fields. So it's it's a really interesting thing because I keep sending things to her. I'm in North Carolina just saying, look, you've got a perfect space to have a, a hangover place for people who are, you know, driving the trucks across country. Um, but there are some issues because they still are using different, you know, herbicide, pesticides, and of course, some of the, you know, GMO seed, which then again has their own things in them. What is the best way for someone to advocate on a bigger level? Are there any groups doing that? Yeah, there are. It's, it's a great question because one of the big challenges that um, commercial beekeepers have is a, are places that they yep. can put their bees for uh, clean forage, you know, to, to rest the bees, as you suggested, between crops, but then also places that uh, people can stage bees or keep bees that, uh, that is clean. And bees, um, bees will fly five miles if they have to uh, in order to find forage, but they only fly generally as far as they need to. Um, so having um, an environment, that's why having a local environment of uh, continuing flowering crops is um, is is really important. So some of the some of the organizations. I mean, first of all, I would start locally. That would be my thing. I always encourage people to start locally in the town. You know, here in, in New York, where I live, um, there are a lot of towns in our county um, that have a, sort of a home rule situation, and they've they've banned their towns around here that have banned uses of neonicotinoids, for example, on public property. They're farmers that can still use them and, and individuals that can use them, but they've, they've, uh, they've banned using use of neonicotinoids on schools and parks and things like that. And so that's, you know, starting locally is really important. Um, and so I would start a new, in the town level, see what kind of regulations they have, if they're willing to, uh, to, um, to institute something like that or encourage that or um, in the county or in the state. Organizations that are working on this, I mean, there are a lot of them. Um, Xerces Society is one. 
um, that uh, covers all invertebrates, but they are, you know, they work a lot with uh, um, um, pest, uh, with uh, pollinators. Um, Sierra Club uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, um, Pesticide Action Network. There are a whole a string of, uh, of organizations that have pollinator protection plans uh, that might be good resources that uh, could give local knowledge. I don't know what the laws are in Ohio. Um, and then there's also the, the, you know, the opportunity to talk to those local farmers, you know, to talk to say, I, I mean, I would never dream of telling my neighbor farmers here what to do or not do on their field, because that's just I, I just don't, I wouldn't do that. But it's, it's having that dialogue is really important because sometimes people do things and they don't understand the impact of, uh, you know, how it's uh, affecting other people. So I yeah. hope that, I hope that answers. No, question. that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And North Carolina is, a, I think, has more beekeepers than any other state in the country, if I remember correctly. Yes, we're strong in beekeeping. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great state. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So in addition to reading and starting local, as well as banning neonicotinoids, do you have any other advice for amateur beekeepers? Yeah, um, you know, I, I just touched on it there that, that uh, becoming if, you know, and again, there's, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. And I found it kind of fascinating um, in this film that there's something that literally everyone can do something to make it better. And it's kind of a rare subject when, when that can happen, where people can do, you know, if you want to become a beekeeper, that's fantastic. If you want to be a gardener, that's fantastic, or a farmer. Or if you want to go to a farmer's market, I kind of touched on all these things in different ways, um, you know, shopping local, supporting those local food economies. But getting involved, you know, as we were just talking about with Ashley, getting involved in policy, if you're not interested in any of those other things, getting involved in policy is uh, another great opportunity. And so, that, um, you know, like there are many states, I think oh, California does, I know New York does, I have uh, legislation that is pending that are protecting pollinators. I think there are 14 states now that have, uh, last time I checked, that have legislation in the, in the state legislation for some sort of pollinator protection um, uh, or one way or another. And um, those are all important things. But gardening, even doing something as simple as having a um, a window box, or if you if you don't have any outside area, having a window box or a community garden um, are really great ideas. Because you know, as I as I mentioned before, honeybees will fly up to five miles to uh, to find forage if they need to. But many of the native bees, and there are four thousand uh, species of of native bees in North America. I think there are twelve hundred or so in California alone. Um, many of the native bees fly and they live in a very tight area. Sometimes it's just a few hundred feet or smaller. And so having this sort of mosaic of um, both habitat and then also forage for the na these native bees is super important. And um, some bees are, are very specific about things that they pollinate. Uh, some bees like honeybees, um, which are not native to North America, um, are a little bit more generalist and they'll um, they'll pollinate many other different things. But having a garden is a, is a super great thing that most people can do and it's, and it's tremendously enjoyable as well. Um, and that habitat is uh, appreciated by you know, the birds and the bees. So that's, a, that's really good. And I'm just trying to think if there are other, um, uh, other ideas uh, that people can do. Um, hang on one second. Uh, Education, of course, you know, that's a huge one, you know, working with a local school and, um, you know, and, and trying to educate, uh, start a bee club or, or ed educate science teachers and see if they can um, get a, a bee program at a school. And then, and then of course, not using um, pesticides, fungicides and, and uh, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides covers insecticides, pesticides, excuse me, pesticides, covers insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. So all of those things are, um, you know, important. If you don't need to use them, don't, because you're going to, you're going to affect all the insect uh, pollinators. Um, so th those are some things that people can do, the whole range. Even buying local honey is a huge thing. There are beekeepers all over the country. Uh, you can find the one or two, usually at a farmer's market or many stores carry local honey. And that's really important because, you know, supporting the local economy 
is if if we've seen anything with the COVID thing in the last year, that is super important to, it's a matter of food security to maintain those local food sources um, and support those local economies. Keep the money in your neighborhood if you can. Thank you for demonstrating how we all have a hand in this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are there any programs that incentivize people in becoming beekeepers? Hmm. Incentivize? Um, not really that I can think of. It's, um, I mean, I, I think the, the incentive is just because it's just so rewarding, you know, for me. Um, it's, um, there, there are, I, I, I should say, there, there are school programs. There are some school programs um, that get funding uh, for establishing um, bee programs or gardening programs that go along with that. But the, the thing that I get out of it is um, it's, it's kind of a losing proposition for me because I give away uh, the honey that I get. If I get honey, I just give it to friends and stuff. And it's just a, the most personal, wonderful gift and people love it. Um, but I love it because it, it keeps me in touch with what's in bloom. You know, as I travel around and as I have traveled around, it keeps me in touch with what's in bloom in different places, what people are eating, um, I always try to go to farmers markets when I travel um, and and get plugged in a little bit to the different um, different varieties and species of things that people are growing and eating. Um, and uh, and it's just, you know, I, I grew up as a kid who was sort of a free range kid and very curious about nature. And so I, I that's one of the reasons why I got into beekeeping was that it's just it's you know, you can spend a lifetime uh, learning about very specific um, aspects of bee communication or bee, lo bee motion or um, pesticides or mites or whatever. People specialize, get doctorates and, and you know, drill into very, 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 very specific areas. Um, and I love the big picture about how things all work together and connect. And, and for me, that, that is the real reward in it. I love the altruism there. That's the best incentive. Yeah. <laughs> is that personal? Yeah, and I, I, I should um, say that you know we do have a um, a website, uh, thepollinators.net, and on there is a, um, a a take action page, and it's a great resource, um, and it's a work in progress uh, because we keep on adding things to it about places, organizations that would be helpful, like what Ashley was talking about, schools that have bee programs. Um, and, and then great resources about finding farmers markets and all that. So it's a, it's a resource that people can, um, can go to and, um, and I'll, I'll put a, a, a link up, but it's a pollinators.net um, that people can use as a resource to find further information and, and learn how to, you know, about beekeeping, but also about how to take action and get, get involved in making it better. Neat. What are the standard routines of a beekeeper? Yeah, so, um, well, it depends on where you live um, and it depends on what you, uh, what kind of beekeeper you are. For, for me, uh, right now, um, it's winter. It's, it's uh, 20 something degrees outside here where I am. Um, and so the bees are in their hive, um, in their hives, they're, they're clustered together. Um, and so now I can't really, there isn't really anything that I can or need to do. Um, and they're wintering over and they will keep inside the hive, they will keep it uh, about 90 degrees um, all winter long. Um, and they form a cluster around the queen to keep her warm and they vibrate. They use their, one of the few insects that can use their wing muscles to vibrate and create heat. And so they, uh, they'll move up through the honey um, and pollen that I left them. Um, and it's an important part of the management process as a beekeeper to leave them enough food for the winter. Um, and they will um, hopefully survive um, in the spring. Um, if we have a warm day as we do sometimes here, if it's over 50 degrees, I'll see a bee flying here and there. Um, but when the spring comes, uh, you know, when the weather starts to warm up, bees are, are weather dependent, uh, light dependent and temperature dependent. So when the weather starts to get a little bit warmer, they'll, they'll be coming out looking for things to feed on. And the first, one of the first things here where I live is um, maple trees, uh, red maple. Uh, people don't even think about maple trees as having a flower, but it's a very nutritious and important flower for, for honeybees in this area. And then I'll usually give them a little bit of sugar syrup 
um, to help get them going, give them a little boost. And then it's a matter of checking on them and just making sure that um, they're okay, making sure that the mites were not too bad and treat if I need to early on. And then just kind of um, uh, keep an eye on them. And, uh, um, and then it's about every two weeks for me that I get in there and just do a check, make sure they have enough room um, and uh, monitor them. And then, you know, just uh, pay attention to what's going on. The commercial beekeepers, on the other hand, and they um, they are now getting ready to go back out to almonds. Um, and so most of the beekeepers are in uh, warmer climates. So some of them are in, um, you store their bees in um, climate controlled units in like Idaho and some of the uh, Dakotas. Um, they have old potato sheds or especially temperature controlled units where they are, but a lot of beekeepers move down south and uh, for the winter and they have their bees out and they're really trying to build up their hives to make them strong uh, to move out to almonds, which is gonna happen in about a month. Um, you'll start to see the massive migration of uh, beekeepers and their bees out to, um, to California. And that is the big uh, pollination in the world, um, certainly the biggest one for any commercial beekeeper. And then from there, they'll either go to uh, to do other pollinations, secondary pollinations uh, across the country, up the, the West Coast, uh, you know, through California into the, um, uh, the Pacific Northwest, and then back through the Midwest, you know, for cranberries in Wisconsin um, and apples. Um, but then also uh, one thing, and it's not something that we uh, really covered too deeply in the field is just in the film is just kind of a passing message is that bees also are really important to the seed crops. So you think about a carrot and it's like you plant a carrot seed, but you think, well, where did that come from? You can't have a seed really without a flower. And so there are people that grow carrot seeds and, and onions and is another example. And so you have to have pollination for those seeds to be created. And so there are beekeepers that do specifically seed pollination pollination for seed growers. And so that's kind of a whole interesting thing when you think about a carrot that you're eating the, something that grew from the seed that a bee pollinated the, the year before. Very illuminating, thank you. Yeah. Um, must beekeepers wear protective clothing or can they choose to wear everyday attire? They, uh, they can. Uh, people do. I, I know people who do. Um, many beekeepers, uh, um, particularly backyard beekeepers, um, I know plenty of people that just wear a veil and a hat um, and don't even wear gloves. Um, uh, I guess I'm a little bit of a wuss and I, I, I don't like being stung. So I wear a bee suit pretty much all the time. Sometimes I don't wear gloves, but I do wear a bee suit because it keeps me cleaner too. Um, but yeah, some people just, uh, you get used to it and um, getting stung, you, you, you know, it's something that happens as part of the, um, part of the process. And honeybees don't like to sting us because they die in the process. Um, whereas uh, yellow jackets, uh, which look a lot like a honeybee, but uh, they can sting repeatedly. Honeybees die. And so they really don't want to. So moving very slowly and gently and, and trying to take your time um, with, with the bees is a, is a great way not to get stung. And many beekeepers don't wear gloves. And, and uh, so I know some people don't wear anything. They just go in there with, uh, without a veil on and, and uh, you know, that's what they do. Thank you. I have one last beekeeping question. Yeah. Can you tell us of a time when there was a problem with a particular hive? Of my own? Yes. Oh. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. The, what, I, what I found, because I only have, uh, I've never had more than five hives at any one time. Um, I find that the hives almost have... Um, uh, individual personalities. And that is based entirely on genetics, uh, um, queen genetics, and um, because they're all come from the same queen and then drone genetics. Some hives are more aggressive, some hives produce more propolis, some hives are better honey producers. Um, so the, um, I mean, I've had mite problems. Um, I've had swarming problems, uh, which is not a really a problem. The swarm is when the hive um, splits. It's a natural way of happening, of uh, splitting the hive and spreading bees to another place. But as a beekeeper, um, having a swarm means that half of your workforce or more uh, flies away. And so that's not a good thing. Um, 
it's exciting when it happens and I've caught swarms and that's very exciting um, because it's like finding, you know, a hundred dollar bill on the ground. Um, and they're very docile when that happens. Um, but it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, there are problems all the time. You know, if, if you see mites, you see, um, that can be a problem. It's alarming. I've never had anything as serious as a serious bee disease, like uh, American fowl brood. Um, but I've had bears. That's another problem that we have here where I live. Uh, we've had bears in our hives many times. Um, and so I have an electric fence and, but bears get through those. And so that's a constant struggle. Um, so there are always challenges. Thank you for sharing. Wow, the, the swarm sounds sounds fun as long as it's coming to, to you. <laughs> um, so next is bee welfare longevity and challenges. The first question is, what is next in keeping the bees alive and what is holding us back? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so um, so the, the challenges that um, honeybees have, um, is, as I mentioned, it's not, a lot of times it gets, um, uh, lumped into one thing about colony collapse, which is a, a sort of a misnomer. It was a thing, it did happen, um, but it's not very common now. And so, but it, it's one of those things that when bee, when honey bee hives dives, a lot of times people say mistakenly, oh, it's colony collapse, and it's not. Um, there, there are challenges, the, the uh, uh, Varroa mite is a, is a big uh, challenge for all beekeepers. Um, unless you live in Australia, it's the only place in the world where they don't have that problem um, so far. And um, so keeping track of Varroa um, and uh, trying to um, keep that in check is a, is a big challenge for all beekeepers. I know um, Aaron sent me a link today that the, uh, the UC system has uh, just uh, got a grant um, for $900,000, which is very exciting, to work on making uh, bees uh, make it better for beekeepers and work on some of these problems. And so there are um, ways to genetically improve, and people have been working on this for a while, to genetically improve bees through crossbreeding to make them more, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, better grooming behavior, more able to deal with varroa, might pick them off um, from each other and, um, and uh, uh, you know, get rid of them um, and more resistant to diseases. Um, but the problems that people, that bees are facing is um, the uh, pesticides, um, parasites like uh, varroa mite and other ones. Um, they're uh, 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 nutrition. Um, so having, that's one of the downsides of the uh, commercial beekeeping is that the bees tend to go and get um, one type of pollen, one type of nectar. And bees like us need a diversity in order to be uh, healthy. They need a diversity in their diet of different um, uh different pollen and different nectar to get those enzymes and chemicals and all that. So having a, a diverse diet for bees is really important. Um, uh, habitat, um, having a place, I touched on that before, having a place where bees can go to be, uh, can be clean and, and avoid pesticides is really important. Um, so I think there's, there's a, the good thing about bees is there's a lot of money is this, this grant that uh, the UC system got is an indication of the fact that honeybees, there's a lot of money. The problems that have happened because of, because of bees, because of colony collapse disorder, um, has been really great for the beekeeping field because there's a tremendous amount of money and funding that is coming from government and private sources, USDA in particular, and, and different places that are funding how to um, you know, work on better genetics with bees and work on some of these problems because there's so much tied up into it. Our, our food system is really dependent upon these commercial uh, bees in a lot of ways. And so there's, there's a lot that can be done and a lot that is being done. It's very exciting actually. Is there more that can be done at the macro and micro levels? And if so, what? Um, what do you, I'm, to safeguard our pollinators futures. Yeah, I think it starts with us really. I mean, on an individual basis, you know, if, if you're a, a beekeeper and, and your neighbor is spraying um, pesticides, you know, I would feel obliged to say something about it. Um, and also herbicides, you know, lawn services are, um, 
are are bad in the sense that they kill um, uh, weeds and we, and weeds for bees. And again, it's not just honeybees, but weeds are really plants that have a PR problem, right? So they're they are a source of nutrition of that diverse um, nutrition that bees need. And so um, protecting, you know, I don't mean we should let the weeds go rampant, but you can cut them instead of spraying herbicides. Um, and then sometimes herbicides are necessary, but sometimes they're just overused. And so I think that um, some of those things, and then questioning, um, again, where our food comes from, you know, um, fraudulent honey is something that, that we didn't talk about, but a lot of honey, if you go to supermarkets and you buy um, honey, if you're buying like a, 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 a major brand of honey, uh, off the, self, off the shelf supermarket honey or a little honey packet that you might get in a, in a coffee shop. It may not even be honey. It might be rice syrup um, that is uh, not true honey. So, so making sure that you're getting honey that is from the USA is really important because there's a lot of fraudulent honey that comes into, um, comes into the country from uh, foreign countries and is repackaged and sold as honey. And so that's a, that's a big problem. So that's something that people can, again, it's for me, it's all about asking questions. You know, when you're buying stuff, where did this come from? Who grew it and how was it done? Great recommendations. It's definitely important to be a conscientious consumer. Uh, I see that there was a question in chat by Cinnamon. Do you want to ask that or would you like me to? Her question is, what are your thoughts about bee houses? I've heard both good and bad things. Yeah, so, so the bee houses you're, uh, I'm guessing you're talking about is for native bees, uh, those little houses that have a lot of different tubes in them. I'm guessing that's what you're talking about. Yeah, so um, the, um, I, I, again, it's habitat uh, for native bees. Honeybees are not gonna use those, but native bees. And um, I happen to be a fan of those. Um, the problem is, is and the way they work is is they're usually little open houses they're open on one side and they have a lot of different holes of different sizes in them and a lot of the native bees what they'll do is they will um, lay their eggs for the, their solitary bees meaning that they're not in a um, organized hive or a colony like honeybees are they go through the whole life cycle in one year and so what they do is the, the, the bee, the female bee will lay eggs inside a tube, for example, um, or a plant stem, uh, which is what they would traditionally do or drill into wood, uh, which is what they do in other places for like carpenter bees, for instance. And um, so they'll lay, um, lay an egg in there. They'll leave a little packet of food with it, block it off with either depending on the type of bee, either mud or a, a cutting from a plant or whatever, lay another one. And so you have this sort of tube filled with bees and then the next year they'll hatch and they'll come out and they'll repeat the cycle. The, it's, it's a good thing, um, but the problem is that a lot of people put them up and then they forget about them and leave them alone. And over time I've read that there can be fungus and stuff that gets in there if you don't change those tubes out. Um, because the way that bees would do it in the natural environment is they would take like a, a plant stem and they would do the same thing. It's a hollow tube, right? So, um, but then that plant stem would degrade over a year. In these bee houses, um, depending on the type they are, um, replacing those tubes is um, uh, periodically is, uh, is a good way to keep from a fungus from going in, which might be a detrimental thing to the bees. But I think they're great. I, and, and it's also, I th think that, um, you know, it's a bigger picture of like um, one of the great things about beekeeping is that it's kind of a, it's kind of an opens the window to this natural world as, I mean, Christina Grossinger in the, in the film said that, right? And so it's a, it's an entree level uh, creature into the world of bees, which I find fascinating. Um, and so if you get into honeybees, you find them interesting. You start looking at the native bees and you'll really get crazy into it because they're so different and they're so unique and specialized and beautiful. Um, and so I, I like the idea that, that these things are popular because it is creating habitat, particularly in an area where you may not have gardens or whatever else. It could be a great thing for, for some of the native bees. Thank you. I think I see a follow-up question in chat. Ashley, would you like to ask this? 
Sure, happy to. Have you um, seen anything in, with the Slovenian hives, which they, they do look like a house, but they've got little mini hives within them. Have you had any experience with those? I, I've, I've been to one. Um, I love the idea. And um, as, as Ashley said, they're, they're, um, they're bee houses. And Slovenia Slova uh, has, I think, the, they're the, they started World Bee Day. They have a long, long, long tradition. They might be the most dense uh, number of beekeepers globally per capita. Um, in this small country. It's just a cultural thing. So these bee houses are, uh, the, the ones that I've seen um, are like little sheds or houses. And so the entrances that the bees come in and out of um, are on the outside and the people can go on the inside and work with the hives from inside the house. And so it's, um, they, I, I think they're really cool. I, I love the idea of it. Um, I, I, I've seen something similar here, but I haven't seen it done. They're, they've been, the ones that I have seen in pictures in Slovenia are very colorful and, and, yeah. um, and I, I think it's a great idea. And so it's a way, instead of having hives sitting on the ground um, like I do or on, um, on a frame or, or boxes or whatever, cinder blocks, these are all in, under a roof and the bees can come and go as they want normally, um, but you can, the beekeeper can work the hives from the inside. So um, can I do a follow-up yeah, from sure. that? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting, there is a gal that's up in the Washington, D.C. area who's been trying to bring them in. And I happen to know a, uh, know a friend of hers who's a retired Marine. Um, but what was intriguing to me, and you guys can't see me, but I am a wheelchair user. So how do you keep bees when you can't lift you know, a full tray? Um, and so this has been an interesting thing. So I've been researching for the last couple of years because I'm determined that I shall keep bees one day, but I have to come up with another solution because yeah. the typical way of doing beekeeping is just something I will not be able to do. So, but um, the gal who's doing this in the DC area actually went and got her um, certification through uh she went to slovenia wow. but she came back and she said you could do this in a wheelchair <laughs> and i'm wow. like oh can you that's awesome so it's yeah. just really interesting but i was curious to know if you had seen anything um in the u.s uh just you know because you know one person right so yeah right they're they're, they're actually you know uh, related to that and i didn't mention it is that they're um where I live in the Hudson Valley, there's a, a, a place called the Hudson Valley Bee Supply, and they're, they're very good friends of mine, very good beekeepers. And they have something at their property, which is not quite like a Slovenian um, a beekeeping house, but it is related and might work. Um, okay. And I don't know whether they, um, they, how it would work or how, you know, whether it's a kit or not, but what it was, it's slightly different because it's made to protect the bees from bears. And so, instead of having a house, you know, it's basically, it's a shed and it's open on one side with like um, iron bars to keep the bear out. Um, but then you can go in the shed behind the hives and work on the bees from inside. And so that, that might be sort of a hybrid, um, a hybrid solution. So, um, but I, I love the idea of that. And I, and I, I think that is so cool. Well, maybe one day. I'm not giving up on it, but yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That is so neat, Ashley. Um, what is the best way to promote the importance of bees in our community, in addition to talking to our local farmers? To promote the bees, there there are lots of uh, lots of ways. I mean, there are um, uh, I, everywhere I've been. Um, there's been a beekeeping club, you know, I, and I know this as being a beekeeper, um, there are beekeeping clubs in every county, in every state, um, often multiple uh, clubs in um, every county, in every state. Um, and so getting involved with one of those is really important. And then getting involved in, um, uh, there are a lot of different programs out there through, um, you know, Whole Kids Foundation, has a, a beekeeping gardening program there uh, there's one in North Carolina 
um, that I'm blanking on right now that that uh, puts bees in schools and it's an educational program and you have to apply to it. So um, I think that uh, getting involved in um, education for school kids, kids love bugs and uh, they're, they're fascinated and not afraid of bees at all, most of them. Um, and, uh, and so that's a great way to kind of seed the future, if you will, uh, for, um, you know, for uh, promoting bees and um, and you know as as I mentioned early on, uh, bees are, are a great conversation starter. And uh, talking about it, I, I you know often talk to different bees, people about bees because not everybody wants to be a keep be a beekeeper, and I don't think everybody should. But it's um, it's it's a great way to just kind of work on a on an uber local level to um, to promote bees. And and even though I am a, a a beekeeper, I also am a very big fan and advocate for native pollinators because there's so many of them and they're essential to our ecosystem. So, um, so it's, uh, I, I think it starts really local for me. Thank you. What are your thoughts on colon colony collapse disorder? Hang on one second. Yeah. Sorry. Ask my wife to bring me some water. <laughs> Um, yeah, colony collapse disorder is, is um, a, it happened, uh, it was a thing, it happened in 2005, 2006 uh, time, and um, it was kind of a, a terrifying thing, and it really kind of propelled the importance of uh, bees, um, honeybees, to us um, on a national and international level. And what it was, was, and it it's actually was uh, discovered by one of the people that's in the pollinators film, Dave Hackenberg, sounded the alarm on it. And he, what happened when it, when it occurred was that he was going through and working with his bees and he opened up a hive and it's like, it was an active hive uh, a, a week before. And he went to the hive and there's, there were, there were not a lot of bees in there. There are a few bees in there. There's a queen bee in there and some workers, but there was just a population. A population of a hive can be anywhere, you know, in summer between 40, 50, 60,000. And when you open up a hive and you see, you know, a couple of thousand bees, thank you, um, uh, the, then you know that there's a real problem. And so he sounded the alarm with it on it and uh, worked with Penn State uh, to try and determine what it was. They still don't know the precise cause of what caused pollinator um, colony collapse disorder. And um, it, they suspect that it was a combination of pesticides and um, and perhaps uh, one or two different viruses combined. And so what would happen was that the bees would go out to forage and then not come back. And so um, the, the way these neonicotinoids work is they affect the nervous system of the bees. And so they have and of insects. And so they have trouble um, navigating, orienting, communicating all the things that are really important to be. So it's kind of like, you know, um, going out and having too much to drink and then can't find your way to your car or something. Um, and so combined with a virus, um, that could be what that's probably the biggest suspect, but they don't know uh, specifically, definitively what caused it. Um, and it just freaked everybody out because um, because it was unlike anything anybody else had seen, and it spread. And so, it, but they have it still occurs here and there, but it's not very common, from what I understand. And um, so that's um, um, it's you know it, it became this uh, terrifying thing that got picked up in the media, um, in the news, and spread, and is still is on a lot of people's mind. The because I always try to find the positive um, spin on, on almost everything. What it did lead to was it led to a, a great injection of uh, funding for, um, for bee study and bee disease, um, uh, bee habitat, and all of the things that, were, um, that have helped um, honeybees survive. And then also, um, you know, in, in turn, native bees. It doesn't happen to native bees, I should say that. So it's just a honeybee thing. But you're saying that the occurrence is less now? Yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't happen all the time. But it's one of those things that if uh, people lose, you know, 30% of the hives, you know, uh, a, a local reporter or somebody might say, oh, it's colony collapse. It probably isn't. It's probably something else because there are a lot of other things. It's probably uh, pesticide exposure or mites 
um, or some other cause or a combination. Thank you. Would you consider Israeli acute paralytic virus to be the leading cause of CCD? Mm, I, I, it might be that's one of the viruses that they think um, could be a cause, um, but I don't know specifically, and I don't think anybody has pinned it on anything definitively that I'm aware of. Okay. Will there ever be a safe way to expand urbanization while protecting pollinators? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I mean, there are urban beekeepers. Um, one of the problems uh, that, that has happened with uh, urban beekeeping is it has become very popular and, um, and almost too popular. So you, because what bees need is that constant source of nutrition and a succession of flowering plants throughout a year. Um, sometimes in urban areas, you get that with um, with parks and people have um, you know terraces and patios, and so they have a lot of different um, flowers of diversity. But if every building had you know a couple of beehives on it, then you're going to not have enough forage to go around. Um, so it's um, it's important to. Um, I, I think by you know creating enough green spaces and community gardens and having these little patchworks and pollinator pathways, if you will, um, establishing um, these uh, these habitats as part of development is really important. And conserving land for uh, for farming and as well as just um, you know wild forage area is uh, is super important. And that's one of the problems that they've had um, in the Dakotas, and we go into that in the film a little bit with uh, with the beekeeper Zach Browning is that because so much land um, that was considered wasteland or um, what do they call agriculture reserve program land they, they would leave uh, uh, Faro because of um, um, for to leave to let go wild if you will that's the, a lot of that land has been uh, planted with corn and soy um, which uh, bees don't pollinate uh, corn because it's wind pollinated, um, and there's and soy is benefits from bees, but it's not primarily pollinated by bees. But the um, the pollen and the insecticide use on both of those crops can be very detrimental. And plus, this land that um, has been good for habitat for bees, there's so much less of it, and that's you know largely due to ethanol. Thank you. This may be difficult to answer, but do you think that bees suffer during transportation? It's a great question. Um, in fact, a local farm farmer near me when I started this film, he's, a, he's the oldest family farm in New York State is, is next door, um, 14 generations. And uh, so I did some filming there um, and uh, they're, they're a great family. And the the patriarch of the family, you know, I told him what I was doing and he said, he said, well, I know why, you know, bees are dying. I said, oh, okay, well, tell me. And he said, it's because they move them. And I was like, okay, um, it's not true. Um, it's, uh, and Jeff Pettis, who's in the film, did a study comparing the survivability of uh, bees uh, that are moved by commercial beekeepers as opposed to bees that are not. And uh, when any beekeeper will tell you, whenever you move a hive, you're probably gonna lose some bees. Um, but um, they, and they, they suffer a little bit, I think, from uh, a delay in reproduction for the time that they are moved. Um, but the, the way that the beekeepers move the bees now is very sophisticated and they're super careful. And um, all the beekeepers um, that, that I know and met along the way, um, they hire specific uh, truck drivers or they deal with trucking companies that are used to moving livestock. And so they know how to treat the bees and they plan their routes based on, um, on weather, temperature, um, and, uh, and, you know, time. Um, so when they're moving the bees from, from like uh, Florida to California, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll drive with one or two drivers or they'll plan their route so that they can stop um, only at uh, night when the bees are in the hive and they'll drive during the day because with the wind fly, flowing over the hives under net, the, the bees are not really gonna come out. But if that truck driver stops and has lunch and sits in the sun 
for an hour, those bees are going to come out and then you'll lose a lot of bees. And the beekeepers say, you can tell, um, you can tell whether a guy stopped or not uh, because of the number of bees that are out of the hive under the net. But they're super careful about um, how they move them. And, um, and so there's the Jeff Pettis did a study about this. Um, uh, he's a, a great scientist and it was a, there was a, a minor um, uh, increase in loss, but not as much as people think. Um, and what happens when, when um, the bees, the bees go out, you know, again in the morning and they do this orientation uh, from where they are. And so they, if you watch a beehive, you'll see often the first bees are trying to do a spiral up. And what they're doing is they're sort of geolocating themselves, orienting themselves to the sun. And uh, then they'll fly off and, and look for forage and they'll spend the day doing that. They'll communicate where there might be good forage with the rest of the bees. And you can run into problems. If you move that hive during the day, those bees are going to come back where they left that morning. So if you move it 15 feet away, they're going to come back to where they left from. But at night, they, they're in the hive. So that's why most of the bees are moved at night is they come out in the morning and they reorient themselves. So if I took my bees and moved them up to Massachusetts tomorrow, uh, not this time of year, but during a, a temperate time of year, they would come out in the morning and they would say, oh, okay. And they orient themselves to where they are and then off they go to, uh, to look for food. Um, so they, um, the beekeepers are super careful. I mean, they're not, they're not treated like pets, um, uh, but they are treated uh, in my experience and what I saw super respectfully and the beekeepers uh, really uh, try to take care of their bees very, very, very carefully. That's a very long answer. Sorry. No, I'm so surprised um, by the fact that some bees, um, they remember geographically where their hive is and where they need to go after they're done foraging. So thank you. Yeah, for that. yeah it's, it's, they're, they're incredible. Their, their navigation and wow. communication system is just amazing. So. What all, what other pollinators should we care about? Oh, all of them. You know, no question. That's a I mean, great they're, answer. Yeah, they're. Um, I mean, you know, pollination is one of the one of the things that I um, wanted to do with this film. Is I was fascinated by the fact that how important pollination is, and I had this theory, um, this feeling that most of us, um, you know, we're three or four generations away from living on a farm, and so we're losing that connection to where our food comes from, how it's grown and, and you know, who grows it. And so pollination um, is really the, the, the reproductive core uh, of uh, to get that fruit, to get that seed, to get that nut. And um, so it's important for all plants um, to not pollination for all plants, I, that's a mistake. Um, I, I take that back. Some plants don't need pollination, um, but for all the plants that that we that grow food that we need, um, it's an essential part. Now, the different types of pollination you can have pollination is done by wind, and that's the long the grain crops like the the wheat and the rice and uh, corn are all wind pollinated. They depend on the pollen blowing off of the tassel or or out of the uh, the um, the bud onto a neighboring um, of stem and then pollinating that. Um, and then that's how that pollination has occurred. But you also have animal pollination and animal pollination can be any one of the 4,000 species of bees um, in, the, in North America. And there's about 20,000 worldwide. Um, and, um, and then, but also the other pollinators that um, are important are uh, birds, um, bats, butterflies, beetles, flies, all of these um, things uh, pollinate and even animals in some places, um, mammals pollinate. I think there was something I saw, there was a, um, a shrew or something that was getting in, it was pollinating flowers at night, you know, is going from one flower to another and was a pollinator. So, but it's essential for plant reproduction. And so um, I, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that there are all these different methods of pollination and these amazing specialized creatures that do it. Um, and with, uh, with food in particular, as a gardener, you know, I, I love to see what pollinates what and, um, and when it happens, because there's some things like squashes, like pumpkins, for example, um, the, the plant is viable 
and this, this gets into a very interesting point. Um, the plant, the flower is only viable for pollination the first part of the day. So if you want to film that, you have to go out in the morning and get it because if you go in the afternoon, it's not happening because the flower is not viable and the bees won't, won't uh, be there. Um, but it's, it's one of the issues with climate change about this is that that sink between uh, when flowers develop and flower and when the bees that are there to, um, to pollinate it. And those things have to be in the same cycle. So if you have a flower that is emerging early, but the bees are still not emerged from their um, hive in the case of honeybees or from the ground in case of uh, ground nesting bees or a stem in case of a, uh, um, another type of bee, then you know you could be out of sync. So the flower is not going to pollinate it and then the bee doesn't have food. So it's really, it's, it's one of those things that we sort of take for, for granted, I think many of us, about the pollination. When you bite into an apple, you know, that was pollinated by a bee earlier in the year and there's multiple trips usually um, of, a, of an insect to that flower to create that apple or name that fruit. It's, it's so important. They definitely inspire me as a worker. <laughs> uh, what would you say is a bee-friendly diet, perhaps local, organic, seasonal, plant-based? For, for, for people for, or for bees? Um, um, what is a bee-friendly diet? Bee-friendly diet. For, for people. Mean, I, <laughs> for, for people. Okay. Yeah. For so, uh, yeah. So there, um, there are about 400 common things that are pollinated by bees, you know, and, um, you know, you think about, oh, so certainly all the fruits and not all, but many of the fruits and vegetables and nuts. If you go into a supermarket and you start looking around, you know, everything from avocados to zucchini, um, you know, many of those things are pollinated by bees. Many of the things that we don't think are pollinated by bees. Um, certainly apples, um, you know, um, uh, geez, I'm just any citrus, uh, just so many, so many different things. But then also it's like beyond fruits and vegetables is like dairy uh, is uh, alfalfa is pollinated by bees. And that's a food for, uh, for dairy um, cattle. And, um, and, and so that's important um, in an indirect way to, um, to, uh, to be, not in an indirect way, but in a little more ob ob obscure way. And then, as I mentioned before, um, so many of the seed crops, onions and, and, and carrots and things like that are pollinated by bees the year before through the seeds, so. Thank you. The documentary exposed how the almond industry utilizes nearly the full capacity of our bee population. From a sustainability standpoint, how viable might this crop be in the long haul if the, if the bee population continues to decline? Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, and it's, it's, you know, almonds are one of those things that are almost solely dependent upon uh, upon honeybees. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done that can be done there. Um, they, the, it's important to note that the beekeepers um, didn't, they've been moving bees for many, many, many years. Uh, there are pictures of bees being moved on, um, on steam trains and there's anecdotal evidence of Egyptian moving bees, Egyptians moving bees on barges. Um, so bees have been moved and that's not necessarily a new thing. The, when we get into these serious monocultures, and almonds is, a, is often a monoculture of one crop of, uh, of flowering tree um, that is dependent on primarily on one insect, you know, um, it's a problem because you have, to, you have to bring in, there are not, bees cannot survive um, in that um, habitat for a whole year um, unless they, they, because they need that sequential diet of food. Um, and so the, the uh, almond pollination is uh, uh, five, six weeks, I think, that they're there for the most part. So they move the bees in before that, and then they take them away because once the, the flowers are done, um, there's nothing for the bees to eat. And so essentially it's a food desert uh, for them. So the what they traditionally did, I mean, when, when almond pollination was smaller, was that there were more hedgerows um, between, um, between the crops. And that's something that people are doing again. Um, some farmers are installing hedgerows that um, can support some 
uh, amount of bees. But, you know, it isn't, in my opinion, it isn't long term sustainable that way because, and that's why it's such a tenuous um, situation when you have commercial beekeepers that are losing bees at 30, 40, 50% annually. And then you have a crop that is dependent almost 100% upon honeybees, um, that that makes it much more expensive. It's not like honeybees are going to go extinct, but it's a, it's, you'll see that in the cost of almonds. You know, when they have to pay more for the bees, it means ultimately that the price of uh, almonds are going to go up for us as the consumer. Um, so I think that, you know, and almonds is, is, a, is a great monoculture, but there are other monocultures that are um, on the smaller scale are, um, are, you know, are facing the same thing. But so much of agriculture has been converted for efficiency, right? They plant in um, the almonds in, you know, neat rows. The ground is swept essentially clean because they don't want sticks and things like that to when they harvest the almonds. And so they keep it really clean. So there are no other plants there that the bees that bees can feed on. And um, and on, from an OCD level, it's it's kind of appealing um, to me. But and it looks neat, but it's it's not a natural environment. So I think it is a it is a collision that is is working right now. Um, whether it's sustainable for the long time. I don't see how it can be ultimately. Thank and even you. for water, which is water is another issue in the Central Valley where most of the almonds are grown. Right. How intensive the water's yeah. huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that. Um, I see that there's a question in chat. Elise, I'm sorry for not getting to that sooner. Did you want to ask that or would you like me to? All right, she's given me permission to ask. She says, hello, I'm wondering how bees do when and if weather gets suddenly warm during winter. Will they all die if they have left the hive? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And um, I hate seeing bees, and I've seen this several times um, when we have it here where I live, um, you know, we have a 50 degree day on early January. Um, we haven't had any this year, but um, I hate seeing bees uh, fly, and you will. I'll see them outside the window. Um, I will see them um, out in the snow, and um, they don't. They won't all die because what they, hopefully, uh, what they do is is if they do have the opportunity, they they're responding to that warm weather and the temperature. And so what they'll do is they'll they'll have a they'll take a cleansing flight given the opportunity, meaning that they go out to go to the bathroom essentially, and they also take that opportunity to to maybe clean out some bees that have naturally died over the, over the, um, you know, over the winter. Um, what can happen is if they go out, if, if you have an extended period, they'll go out and they'll start looking for food and there's nothing out there for them. And so the, there's always that balance um, here where we live about, you know, how much honey do you leave the bees and uh, how much honey and pollen do you leave the bees? Um, so they have enough to get through the winter because you need to have enough, um, uh, stores and reserves for them to survive. And um, so if they're out foraging, looking for food, they're not going to find any in January. Um, but a lot of times, you know, if you have a, an aberrant warm day, they'll just be out flying um, and uh, they'll, they'll do these cleansing flights and then they'll come back and they'll go back into their cluster as the weather cools down again and they'll be fine. Um, if they land in the snow for some reason, then it's a problem because they, they won't be able to um, overcome the chill um, and be able to fly. So if, uh, if a bee for some reason lands on snow, it's, it's, uh, that's not a good situation because they, they test their wings and they have muscles on their wings that they vibrate to warm up their, um, if, you, if you look at them, and as I've looked at them a lot in slow motion, is they, they flap their wings a little bit as they get going to just get their muscles warm and then they'll fly from there. Um, but they don't have the, uh, uh, you know, if it gets too cold, they can't fly. And so you don't want them to get trapped, but you can't really help them. They, they've, it's just a matter of they sort of mind themselves on that. Elise, that was a wonderful question. And Peter, wonderful answer. <laughs> I'm going to open this up to the audience. Does anyone have any other questions about beekeeping, just general questions, bee welfare? 
and go ahead and just kindly unmute yourself if you have a question. Herman, I see you're unmuted. If you have a question, the floor is yours. Alternatively, if you have a question, you can also write it in the chat and I can ask it for you. All right. Well, it looks like we're over. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to. Where is Peter located? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I, I live in the Hudson Valley of New York. We're about a, um, just about 100 miles uh, north of New York City. Um, and uh, this is where I've, I've lived for you know, 30 something years. Um, and it's a great, um, it's a great uh, rural area where we are. Um, a lot of farms, a lot of old farms, and actually, you know, some, something I'll, I'll 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 talk for a minute. I have no time constraints, by the way. So, um, and you, you guys are learning that when you push the beekeeper button, it's hard to get them to shut up. Um, but the the um, the the great thing that's happening here, which is very exciting, and it's something that Sally and I talked about. Sally's my wife and the executive producer of the of the um, film when we were out at film festivals. And it's about this issue of food security and local food um, as much as possible. And I know that's a, a, a something that, that Aaron and you all have been working on um, on your team. And um, so we were kind of beating the drum on this, um, you know, support your local economy in these farmers markets and CSAs and building those relationships and making sure that we, we have them. And as I mentioned, you know, the oldest family farm in New York state is, is uh, my neighbor here. And um, they're great people, um, but they're also a bunch of older farms here um, that are legacy farms um, that are having, that are struggling to, to make it as farms. You know, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult um, job, but what's been really great that we've seen here is because that land is available and a lot of it has been conserved um, through um, agricultural protection programs, they have a good program in New York state about that does that. And so what's happening in some of these legacy farms is that you're getting multiple operations that are coming in and, um, and doing different things. Like there's a, a former dairy and converted to corn farm um, that has uh, seven different operations on it now because they protected the farm. And, and so now they have a, a compost operation. They have a, a, a herd of goats that make goat cheese. They have a beef cattle operation. They have a, um, a seed company that's in their Hudson Valley seed company is on that property. They have uh, small row crop farmers that go to farmers markets. And it's really great. It's very exciting because these people are, are, are uh, succeeding. They're making good things. They're supporting their families on these, uh, on these uh, small things because you can actually do a lot on a small amount of, uh, of land. So having the land is, and land preservation is, is another cause that I am um, personally involved in. And, and um, land conservation is super important because once the farmland goes away, uh, it doesn't come back. And so um, protecting that and preserving that and making it work is, is really important to us all. And, and again, it's something that we really uh, learned um, uh, through COVID last year I know all the people that had CSAs around here sold out and the farmer's markets were super busy because you had people that are like saying, ah, oh, there's a break in the food chain here, uh, the food supply chain. What are we going to do about that? And along with that is, is, a, is, a, is a big interest in people keeping bees, but also keeping chickens and then, you know, growing their own, um, their own food and vegetables and all that. So that's a, you know, that's a, a silver lining to a bad situation, but it's, um, um, it's been very exciting to see that. And we, we were kind of like, people would roll their eyes a little bit about us and about, you know, go to the farmer's market, support your local CSA. And then this year, you know, we got a, you know, more than, more than a few emails of people saying, Hey, <laughs> we, we heard this. Um, so, so that's exciting. And, and again, it's uh, something, it's part of the answer that I think we can all um, um, make a little bit better. Absolutely. Virginia has a question. Virginia, would you like me to ask this or would you like to? I, I think I can see it. Um, All right. She wrote, how is indigenous knowledge being acknowledged in beekeeping? That's a good question. Um, um, indigenous knowledge, uh, if you, you're talking about um, 
uh, indigenous people here or other places? Because one of the things about um, honeybees is that they, they, they're not native to North America. They came with the first settlers. And so they're, they're an import um, like, uh, like many of us were. Um, and uh, when the first settlers came over from Europe, the first Euro European settlers came over, they brought seeds and things and stuff that they um, that they grew back in in England um, or Europe and and therefore they brought bees um, along with them and so bees are uh, basically an exotic introduced species in North America that has is ubiquitous um, but they um, in fact I heard that the Native Americans called um, honeybees the white man's fly. And uh, because they were like, what is this thing? We've never seen it before, the, the honeybee. And because the, but what they also used besides pollination, which was really important. And um, Tom Seeley, um, who's a great um, scientist, biologist uh, from Cornell has written a lot about bees and, and uh, beekeeping and native bees as well, is that he documented the spread of bees, of um, honeybees because they did swarm and they went feral and so they would live instead of a skep which is the woven traditional very traditional uh beekeeping thing they would go and they'd find a hole in a tree and uh live there and set up a, a colony there and so when as the um so they went feral but they were an important thing beyond pollination for early european settlers here was for wax for um sealing um and then also honey for as a sweetener because there was no other real sweetener um, besides maple syrup or whatever. But um, so what Tom did was Tom looked at um, records and uh, in diaries and things like that. And you could see as people spread um, westward in the westward expansion, they would look for bees and you could find them. And there's a uh, making a bee line and bee hunting um, is a is a is a recreational pastime for for some people to to find colonies of bees that live in in trees and um, there's a, it's it's really kind of a fascinating little subset of uh, of uh, nerdy entomologist people but it's it's great um, and. So they would find colonies because if they would find a colony in a tree, they they knew that they would have a source of wax for sealing and 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 then also honey for sweetening. And they would take a little bit of that um, and then leave the colony and, you know, they spread. But they spread essentially together, the European settlers and honeybees as they went feral and became ubiquitous. It's a it's a great question. It's very interesting to think about that. But the the indigenous knowledge here, in terms of uh, beekeeping, there isn't any that I am aware of in terms of uh, uh, Native Americans. Oh, in other parts of the world, um, the Nepalese honey hunters are famous, of course, and then um, and then in Africa, uh, it's a different type of beekeeping, and uh, that's where bees ultimately came from. Was uh, honey this this a species of honeybee, Apis mellifera, came from Africa originally, and they do a different type of beekeeping, and, and that's equally fascinating. Excellent, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. I'm not seeing anything come through. Um, thank you so much for lending us your expertise. Oh, yeah, your film pleasure. was incredible and illuminating. And I uh, just wanted to mention for those who are watching this on YouTube, it this documentary is available on Amazon Prime, iTunes, Google Play, Xbox, Vudu, Fandango Now, and Vimeo On Demand. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, I'm going to post in the um, chat, I'll post the uh, um, our website and social channels um, here that people, I'm just going to bring it up, I should have had this ready, but I didn't, my apologies. Um, as I said, there's a, a, a good source of information um, in, um, in the take action part of our um, uh, of our uh, website and let's see if I can do that. Okay, there you go. Um, and um, <laughs> um, 
And uh, I really appreciate you guys having having me. I'm always happy to talk about the film and thrilled when people have questions because I think that, you know, it's a, obviously it's a, uh, I hope it's obvious that it's a passion for me. Um, and uh, I'm really always thrilled when people want to talk about food and, and bees. And it's, um, it's something that, you know, uh, for me, it's every time I sit down at a table, it's something I think about every time I go to a supermarket to, that I think about. And I, and I talk to the people in the supermarket about, you know, where they're, where they're getting their apples from or where they're getting this from and that from. And I think that that's, um, it's a great conversation because it's uh, food and food culture um, is, is something that connects all of us. We do it, you know, multiple times a day and it's essential. And so it's, uh, I, I, uh, I, it's just a subject that never gets old for me. So um, thank you guys for having me. It's, it's, uh, it's a great program you guys are doing and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So. Absolutely. Thank you. And it's been our pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One follow up question, though, um, yeah. you know, because you've had these multiple documentaries. So is there anything we can look forward to in the future? These are uh, other. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it'll be something in the um, I'm, I'm doing research on that now. Um, it's uh, uh, something in the food and agriculture arena. Um, I'm haven't nailed it down precisely yet, but it's an area that Sally and I are both um, fascinated and interested in um, tremendously. Um, and it, it takes a long time to get a film done. Um, so I, I always want to make work on stuff that I'm interested in because it's a long journey. Um, and uh, but it'll be something in food and agriculture. For sure. Well, we look forward to having you and your executive producer wife yeah. on board uh, for that documentary then. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be, it'll be a, it'll be a couple of years. So. Round two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Really? All right. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying thank you very much. No, oh, thanks. Thank you all for, for taking your time to do it um, for, for, you know, for this. It's great. It's great. I love, uh, I'd much rather meet people in person, but, you know, given the situation, this is, uh, it's, um, it's, this has been a, a really wonderful way to connect with people and, and talk about these things. I always learn something and I'm grateful for that. So. We are grateful for you. Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm, we could continue to talk and talk about this, but, yeah. um, we are a little over time. So. Thank you all for attending. This is going to be recorded. It's recorded already and will be posted to YouTube. I will share out all of the resources, including Twitter handles, Instagram, Facebook, um, all of the links and everything. So stay tuned for that. And thank you all. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you and happy birthday again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>